good morning and welcome to the fifth session of our Koala CoLab 2021 conference series. My name is Jeff Lundy Jenkins and I'm the Director of Southern Wildlife and Koala Operations within the Department of Environment and Science and I'm the MC for each of the six separate theme sessions that make up this year's Koala CoLab series. Before we start this morning, I'd first like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of the country on which each of us is attending today's virtual event and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. In doing this, we acknowledge the continuous living culture of First Nations people, their diverse languages, customs and traditions, knowledges and systems. We acknowledge the deep relationship, connection and responsibility to land, sea and sky country as an integral element of First Nations identity and culture. The country is sacred. Everything on the land has meaning and all people are one with it. We acknowledge First Nations people's sacred, sacred connection as central to culture and being. First Nations people speak to country, listen to country, sing up country, dance up country, understand country and long for country. We acknowledge and thank First Nations people for the enduring relationship connecting people, country and ancestors. An unbreakable bond that safely stewarded and protected the land, waters and sky for thousands of generations. Today's event is the fifth of a series of 16 conference sessions split over six weeks and builds on the success of the inaugural Koala Co-Lab event that was convened at Lone Pine in 2018. Today's sessions were exploring the theme of rescue, rehabilitation, relocation and release of koalas. Our first presentation in today's session will be provided by Karen Scott and we'll look at koala release procedure in the Gold Coast region and Wildcare's collaboration with Corumban Wildlife Hospital and the City of Gold Coast. Karen is the President and Koala Coordinator for Wild Care Australia Incorporated, which is a registered wildlife research rescue organisation in South East Queensland. Karen has been a wildlife volunteer for 22 years and has been a koala rescuer and carer for 17 years. So we welcome Karen to the stage to provide her presentation. Thank you so much, um, Jeff. And firstly, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the department for putting together this year's online conference and giving me an opportunity to have a chat about our Gold Coast koalas. Um, just by way of background, um, in case, in case you have not heard of um, Wild Care before. So um, we are a group of uh, volunteers. We have no paid staff. Uh, we've been around for quite a few years now. And like all rescue groups um, around this area, we have a 24 hour emergency rescue all species of wildlife. So in terms of koala releases, um, I think for anyone that works or volunteers in the rescue and rehab sector, we all know too well that there's a long list of challenges when it comes to reintroducing koalas back into urban environments after their rehabilitation. And the Gold Coast is certainly no different. So um, koala rescuers in all urban areas are faced with the same challenges every day that we're faced with down here. So in Wildcare, we work very closely with the Corumban Wildlife Hospital. And I guess most of the koalas that we do rescue um, are admitted to Corumban. Um, some of those are then also sent on to Australia Zoo for their rehabilitation as well. So we've been working hard to develop a procedure to make sure that we are actually assessing the release site for each individual koala, just so that we make sure that we're getting the best possible outcome for them. And I guess on the Gold Coast over recent years, we've seen significant loss of habitat to make way for a variety of purposes. So housing estates, city infrastructure, large shopping estates, and there's been a few large state government projects as well, such as light rail and one. And I think if you ask any koala rescuer, um, they would tell you the same thing, that they often feel very anxious about releasing koalas back into these areas. 
And I guess the greatest fear for a lot of us is to release an, an animal and, you know, you get a call from through your hotline a day or two or a week later and you, you just hope and pray that it's not that koala that you've just um, released. And it is utterly gut-wrenching, you know, both for the rescuers but also for the hospital staff as well who put a lot of time and effort into rehabilitating these koalas. So um, so it is a bit of a, a tough one. Um, so the release procedure that we've now put in place has uh, evolved over quite a few years and it, it really came about because there wasn't previous to this a huge amount of communication between um, all of the stakeholders when it came to the actual um, time. So, so it is something that has evolved over time, continues to evolve as more elements are added to, into it as things on the Gold Coast change. So. And I guess the catalyst for this came about um, quite a few years ago when um, there was a, the, the land clearing around East Coomera started to become more, um, more of an issue. And we did have a koala that was um, had been rescued from up there, had a short stint in rehab, and then was ready for Somebody just offered to release it, which was really lovely of them, and they took the koala back up to that uh, location where it was found. It was beautiful blocks of land with lots of nice, lovely koala habitat, and the koala was released. And um, it wasn't until the next day that we found out it had been released, and it was actually one checked with council staff. It was actually released onto a block that was imminently due to be cleared. So, so I guess that was the catalyst for us to make sure that there was a system in place that. Um, between the hospital and the rescuers and, and myself as the coordinator that we would have a chat about the the release first just to make sure that we were um, that we were doing getting the best possible outcome and we were covering those sort of issues. So ultimately our objective is to make sure we're making a well and best possible release location and to do that we need to tap into as much information as we can so um, we don't use this full procedure for all koalas. There's still a lot of uh, koalas on the Gold Coast that don't need a lot of thought and planning. And most of our urban koalas, particularly the mature aged ones, are able to be released back to or very close to their original rescue location um, anyway. So our first preference is always still to put the animal back where they came from. And we aren't advocating for koalas to be, to be moved, translocated. And, and in fact, we probably only submit to DES a couple of application translocation requests each year. Um, unfortunately, this year has been a little bit busier. We've had some koalas doing crazy things and turning up in weird spots. So um, we certainly are starting to see a higher frequency of ones that need to be um, put somewhere a little bit different to where they came from. So um, I guess over the years, it's just become, it's not quite as easy as just looking up Google Map, uh, Google Earth anymore and picking a nearby green space on a map because sometimes you do that and you go out there and that green space doesn't even exist anymore. So we need to look at more reliable sources of information. I think this year in particular, we have seen a huge number of koalas that we have had to have more input from everybody. Uh, to make sure that we are finding the most suitable release location. And some of these koalas have been found on the M1. Some of them, have, we're fortunate enough, we've been able to rescue them before they've been hit or they've only uh, miraculously had minor injuries. And other koalas have just been found in heavily urban areas with absolutely no habitat nearby. And um, I think all koala rescuers know these ones. They're the ones you go out to and you think, what in the world is a koala doing here? How did it even get here? So. So we're certainly seeing a big increase in these ones um, over the last few months. So I was just going to outline what our procedure is, um, and I'm sure most groups are, are already doing this or, or at least doing um, most of these elements, and, and some people may even have other things that they need to consider based on where they live. So that's just a summary of, um, of what we do can do sort of go through. First thing we do it is collect as much data as we possibly can, and um, this is generally done between Wildcare and Corumban. Um, and Kate York down at Corumban Wildlife Hospital, who is one of the vet nurses, uh, it's her responsibility to um, coordinate when the koalas are coming up for release. And so we work very closely with Kate um, to do that. So this is all the information that we collect and use that as the basis initially to assess what we're going to do with the koala. So 
uh, the sex. The age is really important. So particularly we need to assess whether it's a mature aged koala or if it's potentially a dispersing young. The weight's important as well. And we check that to make sure it correlates with their estimated weight, um, particularly for those boys. Um, we also look at the original rescue location and try to determine if and why it's not suitable for release. And some of those are quite obvious, like the M1 and etc. cetera, but um, there may be other circumstances and factors that we take into account as to why it might not be suitable. We also look for um, the reason why it um, it's particularly important for those ones that are found in immediate danger or in areas where we know that there is a lot of clearing. So potentially there's been clearing very close nearby um, or they're even on a site that has already been cleared or it's about to be cleared. Important as well. So they're for the repeat offenders that come in. Um, we've had some koalas that have been rescued. Sometimes we may opt to put them back where they came from. And then if we've continued to get too many calls about them or they get hit by a car again or get um, rescued again, then we'll add that information in as well because sometimes that's quite relevant. We also look at any if there's anything else specific um, that's going to uh, have a negative impact on that um, original site. So particularly things uh, like the presence of aggressive dogs, residents that aren't particularly koala friendly, um, and all of those things will play into that as well. And we also look at the anticipated release date, and this is something that uh, we've been doing um, a lot more now and have a bit better system in. Um, so Kate down at the hospital actually flags each koala as a category, so either urgent, moderately urgent or non-urgent. So those koalas that are in care, so because they've got chlamydia, uh, we know that it's not too urgent that we deal with them straight away. But there's some koalas that come in that are in immediate danger, they're healthy, they get a vet check, they're fully assessed and they're cleared for release very quickly. So we want to get them out pretty fast. Kate then sends an email to um, myself and if necessary to the um, council staff and that at least that way it's flagged that we need to get onto that one pretty quickly. And, and now that we've got a good system that um, sometimes even before, you know, once it's rescued and before it even hits the wildlife hospital, we're already starting that process to uh, make sure that the time spent in the hospital is as, um, as short as possible. So we do do that very quickly. Um, and that also gives us an opportunity to highlight those ones that um, more consultation with say council or where we may have need to apply to DES for a translocation request as well. So in terms of um, the next step, so we often then need to consult with the Gold Coast Council. So not all releases need to go to the council staff, but there are, um, there's certainly quite a few that Kate and I just deal with ourselves, but there are some times where we do need to seek the input from the City of Gold Coast in, uh, Conservation Officers in the Planning and Environment Department. So we are really fortunate that we've had a really great relationship and had tremendous support from the Conservation Officers over years and over the years. And they've certainly got a lot of access to information and resources which wildlife volunteers often don't have. So, and that's just meant we've been able to have a more positive outcome for the koalas. So there's a few ways which the conservation officers um, help with the assessment of those. So um, they can provide some input into the original rescue location and whether that's suitable. Um, so that might be again, like where uh, they'll be able to tap into that planning information. If there's large scale clearing nearby, within a town center side. Um, it also helps us identify koalas that might fall within the parameters of other projects. Um, such as the East Coomera project many years ago, and also now the more recently the Coomera Connector project as well. So they can also um, provide information about the proposed release site where we're looking to release them. Um, so if it's council owned land, they may have some input from some of their recent population surveys. Um, so they do surveys quite regularly in those areas and that's, that gives us a bit of insight as well as to the capacity for that site to take more animals. And 
The other thing is our council's now been for quite some years been collecting sightings data from residents and that data has now started to really build up and that's quite important um, for us to look at as well. And, and I guess more so it's important for areas where we don't see very few, we don't see very many koala rescues. So, um, and that just gives us an opportunity to actually assess activity levels and identify those corridors where koalas are frequently seen. So, um, and that just means that we're able to return animals to that area if we've got some confidence that there are, is in fact a koala population doing okay through there. Um, the other important thing is getting NAMU natural areas management unit for council, so they're in charge of the council conservation areas. And if we're looking to release a koala back into that area, then we do need to get their approval to do that. Um, that also gives the NAMU staff an opportunity to advise us if there's any activity happening within the conservation area that might relate um, that might affect the release of the koala, but also our volunteer safety as well, which is very important. Um, so that might include um, hazard reduction burns, but also um, they're very important to give us advice as to the best access points into some of the conservation areas. And they can also provide some information on the accessibility of the site. So some sites are a little bit more rugged and um, that'd certainly be helped to, to be able to pass that information on to the volunteers doing the releases as well. So also importantly is the animal control department. Um, so they are quite active in conservation areas doing uh, trapping and animal control measures for dogs. So they'll be able to advise if there's any increased activity in that area or if they're actually working in that area. So uh, when that happens, the, uh, the areas are closed off. People can't go walking through there, including, uh, including us. So that just helps to, to um, I guess, save us from picking an animal up for release getting to a site only to find that it's closed and you've got a koala in a cage that really wants to get out. So, um, so. Um, and also from a planning perspective, so um, council can um, identify those properties that are subject to DA and are going to be imminently cleared. So, um, and as I said, those East Coomera, East Pimpama areas, that's been very important over recent years. Uh, happening up in that area. So, that just gives us some comfort that where we're proposing to release them um, is not, it's not going to get cleared anytime soon. Uh, Council's also got access to a much better mapping system than we do. So good old Google Earth just isn't, um, isn't really sort of always that reliable. So they're able to provide much more up-to-date mapping um, to help us identify release sites. So, and they also assist us with assessing um, regional ecosystem data as well, which is important if we're planning to do a translocation request. So um, some of the other things that we um, look at is if there's any fire management happening. Um, and that's been, that sort of came about um, we did have a koala some months ago that was uh, earmarked for release. We picked a release site and um, it got released. And then a couple of days later, there was notification that there was a hazard reduction burn occurring in the land adjacent to it. So, um, so we do now, because of that, our system evolved and we added this into it just to make sure that we are making, um, you know, checking that there's no HRVs occurring. So. We do get now the alert emails from the Gold Coast Bushfire Planning and Mitigation staff, and that notifies us if there's any hazard reduction burns coming up. Um, there's also a, a really handy Facebook page for down here, and I'm sure that there's uh, similar um, pages in other areas. And it's I think it's handy to tap into that, not just for planning releases, but just for general wildlife um, things as well. So. So that's, um, yeah, certainly the last few months has been quite a lot of hazard reduction burns occurring around the Gold Coast. And um, and I think it's a, actually a really important tool for wildlife rescuers full stop. So uh, definitely a good resource to tap into. The other thing we need to do is uh, get permission to release the animals. So council, um, council land, we would, as I said, be going through the NAMU department to get permission from them. Um, if it's state land, then um, getting permission from 
Queensland Parks and Wildlife Rangers. Um, so that would be mostly really applicable if the koala had come from within or very close to the boundaries of a national park um, or state forest. But that's an important process that we should be following as well. And of property owners as well. So this is a good opportunity for all for all of us to engage with those property owners and hopefully we can put them back onto the property where they came from if it's safe to do so. Um, we actually also a few months ago started a release site where members of the community could actually sign up to put their name down for their property to be a the different animal. That's just given us a few extra um, options so that if we have a koala come from say a busy street we can have a look on that database to see if there's any property owners in that immediate area that are happy to have animals released um, on their property. So that lets us get them further off the road, um, but still within that koala's home range. The, um, the next thing we need to do is if we are going to apply to DES for a translocation. So um, down here, Wildcare usually initiates um, these uh, things historically over the years. So um, so to do that, we've now actually developed, I guess, a bit more of a standardised uh, request process to do that. We actually came up, um, worked with Brent to come up with a, a template so that we can make sure that all the information from all the stakeholders is included in that document right from the word go. And that just helps us to make sure that there's we're giving everything to the department and then the delegate can translocation that request um, a bit more efficiently. So the information that's included, there's a section that Kate completes from Corumban Hospital. So that's got all the health assessment and any disease veterinary information and also a um, proposed release date. So, um, so we can also then pass that on to the department to say, well, this is we're ahead of time. Um, this koala is going to be in care for say another three or four weeks and then, um, or rather otherwise this one's particularly urgent, we really need to get it out quickly. Um, so I usually then complete the information on behalf of Wildcare, so any of the rescue information, reasons why we're looking for translocation, um, and if there's any other um, circumstances as well. So sometimes what we do is if there's an area of land where we want to release the koala into, uh, we might um, have some extra information that might support that application. So, um, so for example, one of our translocation approvals earlier in the year, we wanted to put that into a council reserve where we knew that there had been a large adult male had come out of that area um, and he unfortunately didn't survive to be released back in there so you know i guess you know kind of thought well that in in theory that should provide an opportunity to put a, another male back in there a young male the city of gold coast conservation or um, officers also put information in so information from their um, koala surveys um, as well as um, anything else that might be relevant and also their access to their, their mapping systems that they've got better access to. So at the end of the day, we just try to make sure that all the data is added in as quickly as possible so we can get that off to the department and um, hopefully streamline that process as well. So um, the last step is actually getting the animal back out and um, this is where we do like to try to offer to the uh, the original rescuers who were involved in that process to see if they would like to release them. Um, sometimes the hospital staff as well. Somebody might be um, particularly fond of a particular animal. They work so hard over so such a long period of time. So sometimes they like to uh, be involved as well, which is really lovely. And it also gives us an opportunity to touch base with the members of the public and sometimes obviously they might like to be there as well. So, um, and I guess that's really important. I think that's really important more and more these days that we do do that engagement with the community. There's a lot of koalas, unfortunately, that come in that are too sick to be saved. So, um, key ones back out and sharing that with the um, community is really important. So I, I guess in summary, um, it's not rocket science and it might seem quite insignificant in the grant scheme of things, but I think it certainly helped us down here to make sure that we have got a process that we follow that we um, and to make sure that we're getting those releases assessed as soon as possible. 
That means healthy koalas aren't sitting in cages for longer than they need to be. They're not sitting, taking up valuable rehab spaces. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to make sure that all of the stakeholders are getting an opportunity to, um, to contribute. I can also recognize um, the underground knowledge of users. Um, and everyone, I guess, has got their um has got the expertise in certain areas and that's really good that everyone's working together i think to do that i think it's also got the added advantage of being able to share the responsibility for making some pretty difficult decisions um, and i know that's from my perspective that's certainly been a um uh, been very beneficial because there's really some koalas that we're just sort of left sitting there. We're all shaking our heads between all of us, the, the council staff, Karumban and myself, are just all thinking, what in the world are we going to do with this koala? So um, these are really stressful. Any any rescue will tell you how stressful this is. And having that decision having to be made by just one person, I, I think sometimes is a little bit fair, unfair. So, so collectively, we can actually make that decision um, about whether to put them back where they were found, um, or, or very close by within the fire park or actually seek a train quest same so, um, and certainly that's been uh, that's certainly been a, a great outcome as well um, and just finally I, I just wanted to if I could please um, just acknowledge a few people um, the city of Gold Coast conservation officers have just been so incredible um, I've been so supportive to our wildlife volunteers over so many years and they work so hard within council to protect their, their our local koala populations. Um, Tina, Alicia, Josh and previously John Calligan, they've all just been so incredible to work with and we really appreciate all of their help. Um, the same as the, all the other council officers in our departments, um, they've been so supportive to make sure that we get the best outcome for our rescue koalas. Um, I also just want to say a huge thank you to the wildlife facilities, um, Karumba and Australia Zoo, RSPCA and Mogul Rehabilitation Centre, um, the vet nurses, admin staff, the volunteers, um, our wildlife rescuers and our wildlife would just be absolutely lost without you all and you just do such an incredible job and um, you know we just it's incredible to get these animals back out again um, and that's because of that your hard work. Uh, in particular, I just want to say thank you to Kate at Corumban. Um, Kate has just done an incredible job with monitoring, um, keeping on top of the admin side of the releases and we have, everything goes so much more smoothly now. Um, and I also just wanted to acknowledge for those that aren't aware, um, WIRES from New South Wales actually funded a Gold Coast based wildlife rescue unit for, um, for up this way, they um, pay for a staff member full time and they also paid for a vehicle fully out. And we were really, really fortunate to have our volunteers, Amy Reg. She was successful in getting that job. And Amy's one of our experienced trauma carers and koala rescue. So she was able to step straight into that role. Um, and in the last, in the first 12 months of operating, Amy attended nearly 300 koala calls just in the Gold Coast. Um, just her alone. So um, some of those rescues, um, wild care members went and assisted with, but it's just been such an incredible help to wild care volunteers to have a paid staff member um, available through business hours to go and attend to the koalas. And it just means that, you know, for us, you know, as volunteers that work in other industries, we don't have to be rushing out of work so often to, um, to go and assist. So um, I just want to say a big thank you to Amy. She's just done such an incredible job and we're so incredibly thankful for the support of WIRES for funding that position. And lastly, I just want to say a huge thank you to all the koala rescuers. I, think, I don't think they get enough uh, support and recognition for what they do. They just work so incredibly hard. Um, they, I just, there's not a lot of people that you can ring at two o'clock in the morning um, that will answer their phone and they literally will drop everything to go at any time of the day or night. So. Um, they see some some pretty gut wrenching things and attend some pretty horrific rescue scenarios with koalas. So, um, you know whether that's an animal that's severely injured and and dies um, in their arms, or whether they're going to a really sick koala who they know they it's going to get euthanized. But um, they all go the extra mile, even if it means driving around for an hour 
to get really good leaf um, just to make sure that the koala has a full belly before they go off to the hospital um, to be so um, and I think I could take the liberty of speaking on behalf of the heads of the other how incredible all the koala rescuers are in this area. I think you, you all do such an incredible job and I'm really thankful for, for everything that you do. Um, and that's that's pretty much it from me. Thanks very much, Karen. And yeah, I just add my thanks to you for, for providing that thanks to the numerous volunteers and groups that provide that service to our koalas across South East Queensland and, and more broadly. Um, you've talked, generated a couple of questions. One of the first ones that's um, there is, have you had any experiences where uh, koalas have been released um, into planted areas as offsets or rehabilitation areas? And has that been successful? Uh, no. Uh, so no, we haven't had any experience with doing that down here. Yep. Okay, um, there's one here that, uh, what would be the key things you'd advise koala rescue and care groups to do if they want to build good relationships with local wildlife hospital and councils, similar to the ones you've just described? I think just reaching out. I, I know like in, in all the council areas, and it's been interesting watching some of the other presentations, it's really great people in all of the councils. I think it's just um, taking that initiative to um, to do that, and I guess we've just been really fortunate over uh, many years that um, that we've had that that touch base with them and find out who it is, send them an email, and organise to to have a chat to them because they, they have they are got such a wealth of knowledge themselves, and um, yeah, I think it's I think it can only benefit all of us in the long run. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question here which. I might tackle first and then happy to throw to you if you wanted to add anything further to that. There's a question that just is, when is a translocation request needed? How far from the original rescue site? What is the process for translocation approval? Um, as I said, I'll speak to that. The koala conservation plan prescribes a requirement for koalas to be released into what's phrased prescribed habitat. And the, the conservation plan details that this is um, koala, mapped koala habitat that is within um, one kilometre of the original release site. And that's the preference, is that the animals are either released at the site that they're collected from or within one kilometre of that, that location. The conservation plan then applies a hierarchy. And if there aren't suitable areas or there is potential for the koala to be placed at risk, by releasing it at the original site. Then there is the option for the animal to be released into suitable habitat within a five kilometre radius of that capture site. It's only in instances where the proposal is to release the koala outside of that five kilometre radius that there's a requirement to submit a request to the department for authority to release a koala. And um, those those um, requests are dealt with through a team that I manage and the information that Karen outlined is the type of information that's required. It's a justification with regards to the rationale for not releasing the koala at its original site or within five kilometres and that can include information about the suitability of habitat. It can include information about the fact that koalas have previously been released at these sites and their fate has not been great, or that a, the same individual koala has been released previously on multiple occasions and been returned to care. So there's a number of reasons and rationale that could be provided for releasing koalas outside that five kilometer area. Um, in considering the sites outside five kilometers, as Karen said, it's important that we have information about the habitat that you're proposing that we have information about the security of the land in terms of whether it's destined for clearing, whether the proposed site is supported by the landholder, including the local government in that area. Um, so all that information is key to us assessing and, and uh, reviewing those types of patients. Not sure if you wanted to add anything further there, Karen? Yeah, I was just going to say, like in, in terms of how many translocation approvals um, requests we would put in, 
you know, some years there might just be one or two. Um, this year's just been particularly busy. We've had a few um, uh, koalas around the Helensvale area and they've capt been captured in the Coomba Connector um, sort of section where that's going to go. So they've been um, referred through to DES. And we've had uh, two koalas at Burley Heads. Burley Heads population is a little bit isolated and there's so we've um, looked to translocate um, monitor dispersing males only. Um, so it's not very often, you know, I, I'll just look back on our years, you know, 2019, I think we had two requests. So so generally there's been suitable habitat within the five kilometres mark. It's just the ones that are, you know, sometimes the ones that just found in really weird spots or that have where there has just been quite significant um, I guess other factors that are that are contributed to it. So it's not something that we have to do. Yeah, it's not something we have to do every week. But certainly finding um, habitat within that 5K mark, generally we can, um, but we still go through that same process and, and try to find the best um, the best place for them. Yep. No, that's great. And certainly with the the sort of increase over the last 12 months, that's allowed us, I guess, to to work with wild care and other groups to improve the process and the procedures that we use in assessing and, and developing the information to support these applications. So it's it's been really positive working um, with Karen's team and also with the wildlife hospitals who are also preparing these types of applications. Um, I'd certainly encourage other wildlife carers to develop those relationships with the wildlife hospitals and the local councils um, where these types of proposals might be required because uh, clearly, with both those groups involved, uh, means the quality of the application we receive and the justifications are, are, are much stronger. The final question I had here was just, um, and again, it might be one that I need to answer, is uh, um, where, where does the data that collect go and who is it used by? Um, so at this stage, that information is provided to the department. Um, the department assesses both the, the mapping and the justification for those um, uh, requests and, I guess, uh, issues and authority, because again, under the conservation plan, there is an authority required and each of those authorities relates to that specific instance. So in, in providing approval for these types of releases, we would be providing a letter that authorises wild care or a specific carer or wildlife hospital to release a particular koala at a particular site. So that, that information is held by the department and certainly useful in us also monitoring how many animals are moved to different locations and keeping track of where animals from rehabilitation are being uh, released. There is another question that's just come through and that was, um, do you tag all the koalas you rescue? Is that how you know if uh, in some cases they, they come back or uh, a return for care. Yeah, so Crombin Wildlife Hospital and I believe um, all the hospitals, most of the hospitals actually do that. They're all microchipped and all e-tagged. Um, and so the hospitals have data of that and um, DES collect that e-tag data as well. And and some of our um, rescuers, some of our members live where there are koalas and some of them know them even by sight, can look at them up in a tree and go, oh, well, that's so-and-so. So. Um, yeah, data as well. So if there is a koala come up, we can look in the e-tag data and um, check who it was. That's great. Okay, we're going to have to close off there just so that we can um, keep going with the next session. Thanks very much for your presentation today, Karen. And uh, for anyone who wants to join the next session, again, go back up to your the screen to uh, return to the timeline and join that next session. So thanks very much, Karen. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, good morning and welcome back to the second presentation of this morning's Koala CoLab conference series. Our second presentation today will be provided by Dr. Tim Portis and Tim will provide an overview of the RSPCA uh, wildlife hospital operations. Uh, Tim is a veterinarian who has worked exclusively with free ranging and captive wildlife since 1999. He's provided veterinary support to conservation projects for numerous species including the Northern Corroboree Frog, Eastern Betong, Eastern Quoll, Leadbetter's Possum, Northern Hairy-Nosed Wombat, 
the southern brush-tailed rock wallaby, Sumatran rhinoceros and Sumatran tiger. His work involves health evaluation, disease risk analysis, anaesthesia and sedation, assessment of short and long-term physiological responses to conservation translocations, and disease investigation in free-ranging populations. He's currently the senior wildlife veterinarian for the RSPCA Queensland Wildlife Clinic, where he's worked since 2016. His professional interests include the health and disease of free-ranging Australian wildlife, veterinary aspects of reintroduction programs, welfare and conservation translocations, and research programs involving free-ranging wildlife and the restraint and anaesthesia of free-ranging wildlife. So I invite Tim to provide his presentation. everyone and thank you for the opportunity to present this morning at uh, Koala Collab. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of koala admission trends to RSPCA Queensland's wildlife clinic, clinic over a five-year period. Uh, just by way of introduction and to set the scene, RSPCA Queensland sees a very large number of native wildlife admissions every year and in 2020, we saw 24,727 native wildlife admissions and they were admitted predominantly to um, the wildlife clinic, which is located at the Wakehall Animal Care Campus and a smaller proportion was seen at the Yamundi Wildlife Rehabilitation Centre, which is a, a small rehab centre on the Sunshine Coast, which is also run uh, by RSPCA Queensland. Um, of these admissions, um, 7,585 were marsupials, accounting for about 31% of our admissions. And of the these animals, uh, 881 in 2020 were koalas, accounting for 12% of our total marsupial admissions and some 3.5% of our total wildlife admissions. So while koalas make up a relatively small proportion of um, wildlife admissions to RSPCA Queensland. As many people who work with them know, their veterinary care and rehabilitation requires a large resource input. So we have uh, a team of four full-time and five part-time veterinarians, 24-7 uh, veterinary nursing care cutters to provide um, the necessary resources for koala care. Koalas coming into the RSPCA Queensland's wildlife clinic come from a number of different um, Sources, predominantly they come from the various koala uh, rescue and care groups and individuals that operate within the, within the region. Um, our animal ambulances also collect koalas from veterinary clinics and increasingly are being called upon to um, rescue koalas from, from the wild directly. And a much smaller proportion come in via members of the public. And these are usually cases where a member of the public has um, hit a koala with, with their own vehicle or found a koala on the side of the road. Um, this presentation provides a quick and dirty review of koala over a five-year period to RSPCA Queensland. In terms of materials and methods, um, we selected data from the most recent complete uh, five-year period, which was uh, first to the 31st of December 2020. RSPCA Queensland uses a Delta uh, operational and, and medical uh, record system, which um, is used in Australian right, overseas, um, designed for uh, recording information for, for wildlife, but it's a system that we use. And there are some limitations to that, which we'll discuss um, a little bit later on. Um, we also rely very heavily on uh, volunteers to enter our data as well. So there are some limitations associated with that. Um, nonetheless, the data were extracted from our database using the report function that's available in this software package. Um, that data was that where the data were then exported to Microsoft Excel for review. Uh, the data were sanitized and any records that were incomplete in the fields that we were interested in looking at were excluded from um, further analysis. The pivot table function was used to stratify the data and today I'm essentially presenting the raw data with minimal analysis. Uh, so, um, we looked at um, the following uh, data from, from the report. Uh, essentially, we we're interested in reporting on the monthly, annual and total koala admissions, monthly and total admissions by sex, yearly admission area, the cause of admission and outcomes 
odds and the time to outcome. So a total of 3,333 koalas admitted to RSPCA, but due to incomplete uh, data fields, <laughs> only 2,804 koala records included in this study. And, and I'll be presenting the results graphically from here on in. So if we look at annual and total admissions um, for koalas, you can see that the results are quite variable over that five year period. It's important to note that RSPCA Queensland really only started to see koalas in a significant way in 2016. Koalas were seen prior to that, but we were really only set up to accommodate them um, appropriately around that time. Uh, there was a peak in 2019 and high in 2020. And it's important to note that there's uh, approximately 500 odd records that were excluded um, from this data. If we look at um, total combined admissions for that five year period, you can see that there's a pretty marked seasonal trend uh, to admissions. So koala numbers really start to tick up in July and remain relatively high through December. And September is the peak month uh, for RSPCA Queensland as far as koala admissions are concerned. Uh, this slide is just another way of presenting that data but gives you some ideas of the numbers that we've seen over that five year period. So this is mean monthly koala admissions um, over a five year period. And you can see um, again that September is that peak month and we're seeing um, you know, over that five year period, 82 koalas coming in in September on average. So uh, just under three animals a day uh, in the veterinary evaluation. If we look at how admissions are affected by sex, um, predominantly we're seeing males with um, 1,382 male koalas presented in that time period and 1,159 females presented over that same time period. Um, you'll also see that some 263 animals were listed as unknown. Uh, and this represents one of the limitations of our record keeping system. Uh, if someone does not have sex of the animal at the point of admission, it's listed as unknown. That will subsequently be determined during um, the following veterinary evaluation. But unless someone actually goes back and updates that information, um, the sex remains unknown. If we look at monthly admissions by sex over that five year period, um, not surprisingly, males predominate in most months. But um, interestingly, in July and August, the number of males um, Presumably that's related to breeding behaviour. Um, another interesting um, feature of this data is that October, November, December, females seem to predominate. I guess the obvious caveat there is there are quite large numbers of animals of unknown sex, so that may influence that. Um, I don't have a, an obvious explanation for that change, but presumably that relates in some way to breeding behaviour for those koalas. Uh, present um, the data. So over that five, the data for um, the local government areas that we received koalas from. So over that five year period, we received koalas from a total of 31 local government areas and a, a couple of animals from interstate jurisdictions as well. Um, listed here are the top 14 local government areas from which we receive koalas or received koalas in that time period. Um, these are local government areas for which koalas were presented in double digits. And you can see that um, Moreton Bay, Brisbane, Somerset and Scenic Rim um, really are the main areas from which uh, koalas uh, come to us. And you can also see um, that there's been quite a, that, that spike in 2019 is sort of well reflected um, for most um, LGAs in this graph as well. If we look at uh, causes of admission for koalas, um, the data that we have here is, is somewhat limited for a range of reasons. Disease accounts for approximately 29% of admissions. Um, unfortunately, with our database, we don't uh, record um, categories of disease. Um, that information is included in the veterinary notes, but is not searchable. So drilling down to more detail as to the main reasons for admission is quite challenging. Um, with the search function or the report function for this uh, software package. If we look at hit by car and dog attacks, so um, traumatic causes, if we combine those two, um, hit by car is 22% and dog attack accounts for 9% of admissions. So 
31% of the admissions to RSPCA Queensland are the result of trauma. So trauma is the leading cause for koalas to, to come into care with us. Um, you'll also note that there is quite large numbers of animals in the unknown and other category representing some 17.6% of koalas coming into care. Um, this again is data admission so the person who is entering this data may not know the outcome it is subsequently determined during um, veterinary exam but unfortunately those uh, data fields have not been uh, updated uh, interestingly we also see uh, quite a large number some 11.6 percent of the koalas coming in are considered to be under threat and uh, they are from three different categories so those that are displaced so they may be koalas that have been displaced due to habitat clearing uh, they may simply be in areas of, of not non-suitable koala habitat. Um, also koalas that are found in traffic, although the definition of in traffic is quite loose, sometimes these animals are found in a tree near the roadside. Um, they tend to be brought in for evaluation. Um, and also uh, koalas that are under threat due to being in a yard where dogs are present. Um, frequently these animals have either minim minimal injuries or no clinical signs and uh, there is a relatively rapid turnaround with these animals being released quite um, it's also interesting to note that um, bushfire um, being listed as a cause for admission accounted for only 1.8% of admissions to RSPCA Queensland. So given the focus on uh, bushfires and koalas um, over 2019-2020, it is interesting that they constitute quite a, a small proportion of admissions for us over that time period. Um, so uh, somewhat uh, grim information, I guess, in terms of outcomes for admitted koalas. So over half of the koalas that are admitted are euthanized. Another 7% um, are listed as being dead on arrival. Um, this figure probably looks a little bit higher uh, than what it is. We have a number of rescue groups that present deceased koalas to us so that we can age them, body score them, um, and collect some metric, morphometric data for them. So the, these are animals that are obviously not being presented for veterinary care. Um, some of them are animals that are brought to us but die on the way. Um, just under 30% or 29% of koalas are subsequently released back to the wild. Some 5% remain in care. Uh, and again, this figure is probably artificially elevated. These are animals that have been sent to wildlife rehabilitators. They have most likely been subsequently released and that information has either not been provided to us or has been provided and not, not updated in our record keeping system. Um, some 3% of koalas that come in die unassisted um, and there's some arrival category uh, again depends on who's entering the data um, they may be listed as an unassisted death rather than dead on arrival um, and some two percent are transferred out so these are animals that are either transferred to another institution for ongoing care uh, for which we don't have an outcome or for which we haven't recorded an outcome uh, or animals that have been transferred uh, to a zoo or fauna park mp process uh, I also looked very briefly at time to outcome, so number of days in care prior to euthanasia or number of days in care prior to release. This data was highly variable, so um, I, I just looked at the first three weeks to give uh, some idea of trends. And you can see um, in terms of number of days in care prior to euthanasia that a large proportion of koalas that were euthanized were euthanized on the day that they came in, so at the point of admission. Um, and you know, sort of a number of others were then um, euthanized within the next sort of 48 hours, and then the, num the numbers variable thereafter. In terms of number of days in care prior to release, um, you can see that, that quite a large number of animals are released um, sort of in that first 48 hour period, and then the numbers kind of trail off um, over the subsequent time period. Uh, in terms of discussing um, the findings of, of this kind of brief study, uh, we acknowledge that there's some very significant limitations to the study. Some 16% of admissions were excluded due to incomplete um, data sets. And, and as I mentioned, that is um, a result of the software package that we use and also reflects um, the variability in, in data entry as a result of relying quite heavily on volunteers. So um, obviously there's there's quite a lot of data um, that we are missing as a result of, of that um, being excluded. Uh, also, there are some data fields that are able to be listed as or recorded as unknown or other at admission. We subsequently determine um, that information. So it could be sex or reason for admission, but that information is not subsequently updated in our database.
Um, we do record detailed clinical notes for all koalas that come in, uh, but this data is not readily searchable within the medical notes function. So this limits our ability to look at some of the things we might be interested in. Yearly admissions are quite variable, but there was a marked spike in 2019. Um, we have a marked seasonal trend uh, with July to December being our peak, being our peak month for intake. Um, we presume that this is consistent with breeding behaviour and it's in line with several previous studies. Uh, I guess one of the exceptions to this is that these studies found peaks in spring and, and, and we're starting to see an uptick in July and August, so the months of winter. Uh, we have more males than females admitted, but in October, November and December. 59% of the koalas come to us from three local government areas, uh, Morton Bay, 13% from Brisbane City and 11% from Somerset. So um, small numbers predominate in terms of koala admissions for us. The most important reasons for admission are trauma. Some 31% of koalas coming in uh, present as a result of trauma. And this, record, uh, this reflects the highly urbanized uh, of many of the LGAs from which koalas um, present to us. And disease um, constitutes of incoming koalas. Um, in terms of diseases, chlamydiosis is by far and away the predominant one that we see. Um, however, we also see a number of diseases that we would presume are associated with koala retrovirus, um, although you know causality has obviously not been proven, but this includes a range of neoplastic diseases, um, some what we would probably consider opportunistic infections in other species um, and a range of other problems. And these findings are broadly well, the yeah. other major epidemiological studies that have looked at uh, koala admissions to wildlife hospitals within Australia. Um, most koalas that presented for evaluation uh, were euthanized and they were euthanized either due to the severity of the disease process. These were koalas that were either emaciated at presentation or had severe uh, chlamydial disease that was considered to be likely um, to be refractory to treatment. Um, in the case of traumatic cases, um, the severity of injury was often the reason for um, euthanasia and any koala that had a, an injury or a disease for which they could, but ultimately the pro prognosis for release was poor, were also euthanized. Um, as mentioned previously, less than one third were released back to the wild. These findings are in line with Burton and Tribe who reviewed uh, intake to Southeast Queensland wildlife hospitals uh, previously, but the release um, numbers were lower than the findings. And the decision to euthanize most koalas was made most often at the point of admission, some 31%. And of the koalas that were released, some 28% were released within the first 48 hours post admission. Uh, just finally, I wanted to talk very briefly about um, the 2019 spike in admissions. There's potentially many reasons for this spike. Uh, at the time, late 2019, saw some bushfires in southeast Queensland, and we had a large number of koalas present to us in in November and we kind of always uh, felt that the spike in 2019 was probably the result of bushfires but when you look at the data some 337 koalas came from bushfire affected LGAs and some 398 koalas came from non-bushfire affected LGAs. So while bushfires may have been approximate cause in some locations um, I sort of started to wonder whether climate climatic conditions could be the ultimate cause for the spike in numbers um, across the region. If you go to the Bureau of Meteorology Summit, you can see that 2019 was Australia's warmest with an annual national mean temperature 1.5 degrees Celsius above average. It's Australia's driest year on record uh, with nationally average rainfall 40% below the average. Sorry, 7.6 millimetres. There was severe drought in southern and um, I think there's a real opportunity to yeah. get um, this. I mean, I think it would be great to combine the data from the various hospitals in the network, um, overlay this with some climate information and perhaps enlist the, the help of an epidemiologist to, to kind of uh, drill down to see whether this is, is real or whether there's some other reason for that spike in admissions. Uh, so with that, that uh, concludes my talk. I'd just like to acknowledge the wonderful staff at RSPCA Queensland who are dedicated to the rehabilitation and release of koalas. Also like to acknowledge the many koala rescue and rehabilitation groups and individual koalas to us and for the all for all the hard work that they do. And I would like to acknowledge Mandy Patterson and Andy 
Anthony Peterson for assistance with uh, data retrieval and analysis. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there is time. Thanks very much, Tim. Yeah, there's certainly some time there and you've certainly generated some, some interest as well through your talk, so thanks very much. Um, question here was, um, Given the, your analysis, what do you think are some of the key challenges or emerging issues that wildlife hospitals will be faced with in the future? Uh, particularly with the, the, the climate data and uh, the spike in 2019, obviously that was highly speculative, but um, there is some other work going on around Australia that suggests that climate, changing climate may impact koalas. So I think that um, this, this could be a big area for us um, in future. Obviously, uh, an ongoing trend for urbanisation um, and the high numbers of koalas that present as a result of trauma. I, I think there's a lot of work that potentially needs to be done to mitigate some of those risks because essentially the work that we're doing is really a band-aid solution. Um, you know, a lot of we need to sort of address some of these problems at the source once the animal comes in. As, as you can see, quite often there's not a lot that we can do. Yep. There's a couple of questions just in relation to the data and and. I'll, I'll ask you one and then I might tackle the second one. The first the first one is, would it support your studies and analysis if rescue groups better understood how to input data, i.e. fields, diagnosis of disease, and if there were a defined process to update the status of the koala in the database, which at the moment is maintained by rescue volunteers? Uh, so I'll just clarify the the database that we use is maintained by RSPCA Queensland and the import of data is, is through our volunteers. So the koalas that come in will have a koala rescue sheet, a state government koala rescue sheet um, filled out and, and usually the data that's um, included in there is, is very, very good. The fields are included. Um, the, the limitation I think is, is at our end uh, with uh, quality control of the data. So people kind of going back and ensuring that that process is completed and I guess it's just important to to note that um, we're doing this for some 25,000 animals per year not just for the koalas that come in so uh, there's definitely uh, room for improvement and this is something that we we are seeking to to address but um, those issues of data quality predominantly rest with us rather than with the rescue and care groups. Yep thanks um, just by way of comment to add to that one I think certainly uh, RSPCA is part of the SEQ Wildlife Hospital Network, and that uh, includes uh, Corumban Wildlife Hospital, Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital, and the Mogul Koala Rehab Centre. And as a network, we meet regularly to discuss these types of issues. And I think there's certainly a, a shared interest in improving the quality of data. So uh, one of those may in fact be that we provide some additional information or some training to carers in the future with regards to um, how that data is important and how it, it should best be filled out to provide the best benefit to the hospitals in this analysis. Um, there's a question here just in relation to the last collab. there was talk of on Koala Base as an outline or an online database and research tool that summarises data collected on koala mortalities and morbidities in southwest Queensland. The, um, the question was, are all the hospitals using this and where is this uh, data as attendees, we're all very excited about the possibility of this data coming together. So I, I can probably provide an initial response to say the the Koala base was developed as a tool by University of Queensland. So they developed this online database. It's the database which collates the information from the department koala record sheets. So as Tim said, majority of koalas that are uh, rescued by care groups and admitted into wildlife hospitals are accompanied by a data sheet which contains the basic information which is entered into Koala Base. Um, Koala Base has probably had similar problems that Tim has described for the RSPCA database um, but we're certainly keen to work with UQ and the hospitals to improve the quality of the data that comes in there. I can also say that um, we do uh, regularly take extracts of the data from uh, Koala Base and it is available through the Queensland Government's uh, data portal. Uh, again, I'll endeavour to provide a link to uh, participants so that they can identify where that data is stored and access to that data. 
Um, prior to loading that data into the portal, we obviously do some cleansing of the data, again, to accommodate the types of issues that um, Tim identified in terms of missing data or incomplete data sets. Um, not sure if you wanted to add anything further on with regards to koala based Tim. Um, I, I need to say that we, we currently aren't using it despite lots of discussions about heading in that direction. Um, to me, it makes a lot of sense that um, all of the hospitals in the network contribute to a central database so that that information is available, that it can be analysed and it can help um, you know, contribute towards koala conservation as well as the, the work that the hospitals are doing. Um, probably got time for one last question. That is, um, does the RSPCA provide training for their wildlife carers? Uh, that's not something that we have done much of uh, in, in the past, but it is something that we're hoping to, to do more of in the future. Um, currently working on um, some educational resources to um, provide information to, to uh, private veterinary practices within um, the metropolitan area. And I have certainly provided some training to some private practices within the Brisbane metropolitan area, but uh, it's certainly something that we're working on and, and hope to be able to offer more of uh, into the future. Yeah, and I can just reinforce that, again, that's a conversation we've had as part of the SEQ Wildlife Hospital Network and very keen to ensure that carers and also um, veterinarians who aren't part of the Wildlife Hospital Network have access to information and resources to assist them in, uh, I guess, triaging and caring for koalas that come into their uh, care. Um, we're going to have to uh, cut it off then so that we can set up for the next session. Um, so again, when you're finished here, just jump to the timeline to go back for the next session. Uh, I'd just like to thank Tim again for his presentation this morning. Thank you. Our third presentation this morning will be given by Dr. Rosie Booth and it's key messages from Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital Koala Admissions data from 2004 through to 2001. Rosie has had about 40 years experience as a zoo and wildlife animal veterinarian. She began her wildlife career at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary while undertaking postgraduate research on stress in koalas. She spent six years working with the Zoological Board of Victoria on both native and exotic animals. Uh, she then returned to Queensland to work at Corumban Sanctuary and later at David Flay Wildlife Park. She's done considerable field work with koalas, platypus, macropods and eastern bristlebirds. Uh, she has a commitment to passing on knowledge through workshops, lectures and has more than 90 publications including three chapters in editions of zoo and wild animal medicine. Her greatest professional interest is in conservation. From 2004 to 2011 she was the coordinator of the captive breeding of threatened species for Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. And in Rosie's current role as the director of the Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital, she has the opportunity to work in the fields of wildlife rehabilitation, research, disaster response and conservation. So I look forward to Rosie's presentation this morning. Thanks, Jeff. We want to uh, see if there are other messages to be obtained from the koala data from Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital. And the span of years is from 2004 to 2020. So um, just quickly, our mission statement is to rescue, repair, rehabilitate and release native Australian fauna and contribute to research that supports conservation of biodiversity. Under this mission, we have provided a second chance now to more than 10,000 koalas. Um, we've done the best that we can to collect as much data from that experience in order to help inform management of koalas from a conservation perspective. And uh, I want you all to be aware that it costs up to $10,000 to treat a koala that comes into care for either disease or trauma for an average of six weeks in care. So it's a very expensive activity and it's very important to us that it has a positive outcome for the species as well as the individual. 2018, the Department of Environment formed the Southeast Queensland Wildlife Hospital Network, which combines the um, effectiveness of the RSPCA Wacol Wildlife
from the Wildlife Sanctuary, Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital and Mobile Koala Rehabilitation Centre. We all have um, consistent goals uh, and more streamlined protocols so that we are all um, and we share our data with the department. So the admission numbers from 2004 to 2021, which is an 18 year period, we have passed 10,000 koala admissions. So of those animals, they have either been displaced from their habitat, they've been either hit by cars, attacked by mostly domestic dogs, or affected by disease. So of that 10,000 animals, more than 4,000 have been rehabilitated back to the wild. So just looking at the cause of admission in greater detail, chlamydiosis accounts for 42% of Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital's admissions, which is horrendous. Um, car trauma accounts for 23%, dog attack 8%, and other 27%. Most of the other, more than half of the other is orphans that are orphaned by disease, car or dog attack. But our current database can't um, connect those dots. It's really important to understand the impact of humans um, growth for all species. So if you can see, these are the seasonal variations in the hospital. This dotted line here is the trend will increase in our hospital admission. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, we just seem to have had a slight technical difficulty with Rosie's uh, internet connection. So there's a slight break in her presentation. Um, provides me probably with an opportunity to talk a little bit further about the SEQ Wildlife Hospital Network. Um, as Rosie indicated, it commenced in uh, 2017. And since that time, the Queensland Government has continued to provide funding uh, grants to each of the wildlife hospitals to continue to support their role in providing uh, treatment, care and rehabilitation services for sick and injured wildlife with a key focus on, on koalas. Um, and I think the data that uh, the presenters are showing, so uh, we've already had Tim Porter's present. Rosie was partly way through her presentation and we also will get some information from Michael Pine from Corumban indicates that there's increasing trends in, in the numbers of animals that are being admitted to care, and that includes the numbers of koalas that are being admitted to care. So I think that, that emphasises the importance of the work that's being done in all of these four institutions, and by the huge army of volunteer carers that uh, are also supporting those networks. Um, as I said, uh, as a SEQ Wildlife Hospital Network, we're constantly reviewing our policies and procedures, and also looking at ways in which we can, I guess, support better outcomes for the animals, including the koalas that come into care. And uh, a big focus in the coming 12 months will be around providing information products uh, and training to carers and to veterinarians in relation to dealing with the, the triage, the treatment and uh, rehabilitation and release of uh, koalas and other wildlife, because we recognise that um, the numbers of animals that are coming in, in a number of occasions, uh, the carers and the veterinarians are the key um, components to ensuring a good outcome for those animals. So we're certainly very keen to, to work on that further. 
Um, somebody's posed a question here which doesn't necessarily relate to um, Rosie's talk, but it, is there any data on the impact of feral cats and dogs on koala populations? And um, that, that data, I guess, um, in some ways comes in in some of the mortality related statistics that uh, appear with hospitals, but there are also some other studies. And again, I think today we'll hear a presentation from Deirdre de Villiers, who works with the Endeavour Veterinary and Ecological Services team. And some of the work that they've done has certainly revealed that uh, in some areas, uh, wild dogs, as well as domestic dogs, are uh, important um, threats to uh, koala populations. Um, feral cats, there are, is less data to indicate that they are a significant threat, but obviously with uh, juvenile and smaller koalas, uh, they can certainly provide uh, a risk to animals once they're on the ground and also, uh, I guess, in, to some extent within trees. Uh, the secondary impact of feral cats is obviously through toxoplasmosis. That would be something that I'd I guess rely on uh, advice from, from Rosie and the other veterinarians who are presenting today to provide information um, about the prevalence of those types of diseases in, in koalas in particular. We don't seem to have, uh, I think the team are just working to try and get Rosie back on, online and uh, hopefully we can um, recommence her presentation shortly. Share the screen, share the screen. One of, one of the uh, things that I'd, I'd also remind people who are attending today's session is that uh, we will be providing you with a um, opportunity to fill out a survey at the end of today's um, session. And we're seeking information in relation to all the previous sessions to help inform the final wrap up session uh, we will conduct next week. So really encourage um, everyone to participate in that survey just so we can compile that information to assist us in improving uh, the quality of uh, the CoLab sessions, but also in relation to identifying and addressing any issues with uh, the information and uh, research that's been conducted to date on koalas. Uh, it looks as though we've managed to solve the technical problem for Rosie. So um, I'll hand back over to Rosie and she can continue her presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I thought you were being extremely rude talking over the top of me alone. Um, so I'm not sure how far we got with our gender ratio of release, but I'll just uh, repeat it briefly. So when we, we are receiving equal numbers of males and females in admission, but we release far more males than females until we identified that this imbalance was happening. The reason for that is that the females often have severe reproductive tract disease, which renders them unreleasable because they're infertile. So there's a higher euthanasia rate for females. So if we look at uh, chlamydiosis, it's uh, almost equal numbers of males and females affected by chlamydiosis in the 4,349 koalas that we've seen admitted with chlamydia. And um, obviously that is a very significant um, disease threat for the species. The other significant disease threat that we see is koala retrovirus. It is um, listed as a diagnosis for 3% of our 10,000 admissions, but it is um, probably also involved in another 10% of diseases caused by opportunistic pathogens or um, cancerous diseases, neoplastic diseases that um, can be caused by oncogenic viruses. So uh, we also believe that koala retrovirus has a, a significant role in uh, the susceptibility and severity to chlamydial disease. So. Um, we, we believe uh, koala retrovirus is another um, major threatening process for koalas. So if we look at our Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital admissions by a local government area, um, our catchment is more the north, RSPCAs is more the west, and um, Corumbans is more the south of southeast Queensland. So you see um, our largest, our most significant catchment is from Moreton Bay which is this area here, Moreton Bay Regional Council. 
And if you see this pie chart of uh, the koalas that are admitted to us from there is um, the red is the deceased ones and the green is released. So if you look at all of these pies for the local government areas, you see there are many more koalas that need euthanizing than there are koalas that can be successfully released, admitted to our wildlife hospital. We look closer into that Moreton Bay Regional Council into the suburb of origin. Again, you see the grim reality of more koalas requiring euthanizing than koalas that there are to be released from each of the suburbs. And you see these top three suburbs here of Brisbane, which is the major human development its habitat being cleared for additional housing estates. So this um, slide, and I might have to play this more than once, is um, each year, just the last five years where our data is, is extra clean, the um, admissions to Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital plotted by year on the map of protected koala habitat. So this is the core koala habitat um, mapped in the koala conservation strategy. And if you watch that play through a few times, you will see that the koalas are mainly being admitted to hospitals from the urbanized footprint of Brisbane. So I've not seen many koalas from the core koala habitat. To me, this is a um, reality of us pushing koalas out of habitat that they once saw as core habitat into the west. And if we look at the, the next map, this is koalas from Moreton Bay Regional Council, which are now dead. So this is more than a thousand koalas over a nine year period who have um, not been able to be returned to their, um, to the wild. And you can see very clearly that um, the deaths occur along major roads and in major areas of development. Of those 1,096 koalas that have been lost from the Moreton Bay Regional Council in the last nine years, each year there are less and less being lost, which is not in my view a good sign because I think this is an indication of the population declining but um, it's probably good for them not to be more koalas in that urban footprint because it's not a great place to be a koala. So once koalas at the hospital are cleared for release within their prescribed habitat, they can sometimes be recruited into monitoring programs. And um, this illustration on the right shows you um, what urban koalas do in their day. So this is a koala called Benson who was released in a nice little bit of koala habitat down here to the south of this picture. And uh, he was tracked walking up the road, taking his time crossing around about and then settling into a food tree to do a bit of eating. But this is the world that an urban koala has to, to live in. So we currently get permission to translocate uh, koalas less than six a year when we feel that um, putting them back into their prescribed habitat is too much of a risk. But um, often uh, we do need to put them back into their prescribed habitat because the, you know, if the animal is more than six years of age, they have a known home range and they are less suited to translocation. Um, just quickly, the admission hotspots for our hospital, um, Moray Field, Burpengary and Narangbar, which we saw on that um, suburb map. So, the death rate for those suburbs is twice the survival rate. So the, um, the, the overall effect on the population of development is a gradual um, death by a thousand cuts to the urban koalas. And this uh, picture of a koala illustrates what, what they are faced with is a young koala setting out trying to find a place to live and it finds the closest thing to a koala fork in a, in a new house being built. Um, so the other tragedy koalas is that if we do put them back out into the wild after putting $10,000 worth of effort into them, 
they um, will often be returned to us within um, a, few, a matter of months. So um, in the data that I've examined for readmissions, it's just five years of data from 2013 to 2017. A hundred koalas were readmitted and half of those were killed um, within a few months of, of being released. So that's half a million dollars worth of treatment and re rehabilitation costs that have been wasted. The worst suburbs for readmission have been Petrie, Tanana and Kippering. And this um, illustration is what uh, koalas are facing in that urban environment. So the key messages from this data, urban koalas are in serious trouble. In my view, the legislation that requires release within prescribed habitat of one to five kilometers from rescue location often puts koalas in imminent danger. It costs approximately $10,000 to rehabilitate one sick or injured koala. Hundreds of koalas have been killed within months of return to their prescribed habitat. It is wasteful of both koalas and resources to keep putting them back in an increasingly developed landscape. So how can a koala be expected to safely navigate an urban landscape? They have evolved to live in forests and have survived for 20 million years since European settlement it has taken us a mere 200 years to gouge significant holes in their habitat. If we can stop what we are doing for koalas, then so many other species will benefit from the protected forests that remain. We can live with less, change development practices to leave behind functional wildlife corridors and use wildlife fencing on major roads and provide wildlife crossings. We need solutions to help, hold, help them hold on. Habitat protection and connection is what they need most. We need to remove that outdated definition of prescribed habitat from the Nature Conservation Act. We need to control the diseases and only treat animals with mild disease and we can help prevent diseases against chlamydia. I think um, we must not release dispersing young animals back into the urban footprint because it just dooms them to a unimaginable fate. And just again, the most important thing that koalas need is habitat protection and connection. That's me done, Jeff. <laughs> thanks, Rosie. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Rosie. And, and apologies for the, the break we had in transmission and for me rudely talking over you. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think anybody else heard you, but um, I, th I think uh, it, for you it may have been a bit disruptive. Um, I've got one question here, which is um, with the dwindling population, why are non-breeding females still euthanized? Uh, and the person sort of surmises, I suppose they still have a role in the colony. Um, so a female koala with reproductive tract disease is you can't release them with their reproductive tract intact because it is severely abnormal. Um, often there'll be massive abscesses, it's causing um, general ill thrift to the animal. So they're not just a cheerfully infertile animal, they're an animal with a horrible disease of their reproductive tract, which is making them feel sick. So the uh, surgical procedure to remove a cystic abscess reproductive tract is, is not something that anyone would embark on as a, oh, let's just quickly spay that animal and pop it back in the wild. Two weeks of um, post-surgical pain relief for an animal if it was a surgical candidate, but most of them aren't. Um, does that answer that question enough? I think so. I think you've just sort of talked about both the welfare issues and also, I guess, the the ultimate outcome of, of intervention of that type. Um, mm. your, the question or the, the, the statement you made about the Nature Conservation Act and the definition has sort of triggered a question. So um, the, the question says, thanks, Rosie, current legislation is not helping, but where would we release them outside of the urban footprint? What is considered safe habitat, especially in Moreton Bay region? Um, west of Lake Coomba. <laughs> the, the, to the west is better. I mean, you can see from that map of um, koala, protected core koala habitat that the conservation strategy has allowed for. 
um, definitely to the west is better. So, um, you know, I think that the young dispersing animals would benefit from being released west of Lake Kowongba, which is a little bit of a barrier for them to return back into the um, urban environment. The, for the animals that have grown up and developed a territory within the urban footprint, that's a much bigger challenge, which that's, yeah, that needs a committee. <laughs> Yeah, and I can, I can probably add some, some information there in that um, based on the feedback we've received from the process that we currently have in place, we're currently reviewing our approach to translocation as a component of developing a broader wildlife translocation policy and procedures. So um, there's a paper will be presented to the Koala Advisory Council, which Rosie is a member of, and that's proposing uh, some principles and an approach towards developing some uh, better and more contemporary translocation policy. And mm. that, that focuses on the fact that translocation shouldn't just be a last resort technique that's used in that it is a legitimate way of managing wildlife populations, but obviously needs to be done in a manner that's um, consistent with the best science available in terms of what are the risks and what are the benefits in moving and, and relocating animals and which provides the best opportunity for a successful outcome for the animals and contributes long term to the conservation of koalas. Um, mm, yeah, no, thank uh, you. Um, uh, somebody's posted a question here that says climate change is having a severe impact on the west of Moreton Bay region. Um, and infers that there's some changes to leaf chemistry occurring. I wasn't sure if you had any response in relation to that question. Um, climate change is of great concern for Western koalas, I think more West than West of Lake Kowongba. So, you know, as the temperature increases, um, the leaf dries out and becomes even less of a good thing to be eating. Um, and of course, koalas, I don't think, survive very well at high temperatures anyway. So, you know, the, the threat of climate change is very real and very frightening for the whole species. But um, leaf chemistry, you know, the leaf water in particular, I think, is, is critical. But leaf chemistry beyond water, um, it's not my area of expertise, but it is a concern, the effect of climate change. That's great. Um, there, there was a couple of there's a couple of statements in in the I guess the the question box now, and they're more in relation to I guess some of the considerations around translocation, and they're talking about um, problems with wild dogs in western areas and having the right food trees and questions of overabundance. So I think um, that probably relates a little bit to what um, Karen spoke about earlier in terms of some of the information that's presented in putting forward a case for translocation. So did you want to comment on, on that in terms of when you're selecting potential sites for release of animals, how do you deal with those types of things? Oops, I've, looks like I've scared Rosie off with that question. Um, I might in fact just answer that one myself. <laughs> um, certainly again, I think as I emphasized uh, in responding to questions that came up during uh, Karen's talk on behalf of Wildcare. The process for putting forward an application for release out pres outside prescribed habitat provides a justification of why it isn't suitable to release an animal at the location it was collected or rescued from, but also provides a justification with regards to the benefits of releasing that animal at a different site. So in considering a release at a different site, consideration will be given to the security of that site in terms of its tenure and any future development potential. We would also look at the presence of the suitable trees and habitat and in relation to the presence of threats. So that would be wild dogs, the prevalence or presence of disease in those locations. So all of those things are part of the consideration that's made before we um, approve requests for any release outside prescribed habitat for koalas. Um, we need to probably finish there just to join in for the next session. Uh, I thank Rosie for her presentation. Yeah, good morning and welcome back to the fourth presentation of this morning's Koala CoLab conference series. 
Our fourth presentation this morning will be by Deirdre de Villiers, and it'll be into research conducted by Endeavour Veterinary and Ecological in relation to the movements, health, and translocation of koalas in southeast Queensland. Deirdre's worked as a koala ecologist for over 24 years in both the public and private sectors. She worked for state government for the majority of this time investigating the management requirements of the southeast Queensland koala population. This work included surveying koala populations to gather baseline data, monitoring of population trends, undertaking translocation programs, and investigating koalas impacted by development. This work also included biodiversity planning and assessments and the drafting of legislation guidelines such as the Koala Conservation Plan and Management Strategy. During this time, Deirdre completed a PhD from the University of Queensland investigating the ecology of urban koalas and regional population dynamics. Deirdre is currently working for environmental consultancy Endeavour Veterinary Ecology and has continued this work to better manage and conserve koala populations in Queensland. The project she's been involved in included koala management on the largest koala monitoring project in Queensland, the Moreton Bay Rail, where despite the construction of a rail line, the population has recovered and maintains a growth trajectory. She's continued to work in the Redlands and manages the Redlands City Council Koala Safe Neighbourhoods Koala Tracking Program on behalf of the University of the Sunshine Coast. So just welcome Deirdre to provide her presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Yep, so I'll be talking about the um, Koala Translocation Program for the Moreton Bay Rail uh, project, as Jeff mentioned. So firstly, some translocation definitions. So the IUCN um, defines translocation as the human mediated movement of living organisms from one area with release in another. So that can be plants and animals. Um, within this category, there's different conservation, uh, there's different translocations. So conservation translocations, um, as the name suggests, is to conserve populations of plants and animals. So movements to create, restore or supplement populations. Um, management translocations, on the other hand, um, are movements of animals to mitigate human derived conflicts or impacts of um, particularly habitat clearing, um, development threats or um, threats from urban activities such as you know domestic dogs, cars, um, and overabundant or problem wildlife as well. Um, the conservation translocations have been associated with improvements in the conservation status of around 40% of um, vertebrate species around the world. So they do work when um, they are intended to um, act to conserve populations. Um, from a local point of view, um, as Jeff described earlier, explained earlier, the Nature Conservation Koala Conservation Plan um, identifies translocation of koalas as the release of a koala outside of its prescribed natural habitat. Um, and the prescribed natural habitat is defined as an area within one kilometre of where the koala was taken, um, if there is koala habitat within that area, or otherwise any habitat within five kilometres from where the koala was taken. Um, now this differs to a relocation where um, that is the release of the koala within its prescribed habitat, but usually the koala is released um, at a different point to where it was captured. Um, there are issues with translocation and translocation is still quite um, controversial. Um, management and mitigation translocations in particular um, are often unsuccessful um, for a variety of reasons. Um, often they're not scientifically robust, they're um, ad hoc and reactive. So if land is undergoing development or clearing, um, you might have spotted catches out there clearing um, trees and grabbing animals and um, moving them, but not koalas. Um, there is very limited or no monitoring of animals. So there's been many case studies, you know, around the world that show um, that animals just get released um, and reviews done to look at the success of translocation. And without that ongoing long-term management, it's really hard to tell whether that um, translocation has been successful or otherwise. Um, there's often negative impacts on um, the translocated um, koalas or the receiving population um, and, you know, the 
um, spread of disease and genetic negative genetic alterations of that receiving population from the animals being translocated into it. And of course, the, the main thing is high mortality rates of translocated animals. Um, they often have failure to adapt to their new habitat and um, are you know, usually bent on dispersing and movements away from that translocation receive site um, to their detriment. So, you know, then encountering um, dogs, cars, and, um, you know, and, and um, you know, e extra activity on, on an animal that is, um, that is very low tolerance for, um, you know, doesn't have a lot of reserves like the koala does. Um, so translocation of koalas, they were first, first koalas first translocated in Australia to the islands of Victoria in the late 1800s. Um, and this was during the peak in the fur trade and there's various stories about why they were put on, put on these islands. But the program has been very, if not too successful. And um, the translocation of koalas now from some of these islands initially to other islands and then from those islands as they became overabundant back to the mainland. Um, it's caused localised um, overabundance on some of those mainland sites too and they've had to be translocated again. So this is, um, it's a very cautionary tale of translocation um, and the, the, I guess, the long-term unforeseen results of translocation if, if not managed properly and, um, and yeah, exactly what, what can happen if, if, you know, you put animals where, where they shouldn't be, I guess. Um, and it's, they've estimated around 40,000 koalas have been um, translocated in Victoria um, from the islands to the mainland since the 1920s. So getting to the Moreton Bay Rail um, program. So the corridor had been preserved for over a hundred years and it was fast tracked in um, 2012, I think, as an election commitment. So um, having this corridor preserved um, for, you know, for over a hundred years meant there was a lot of koala habitat along the rail corridor. And this varied from intact bushland areas to um, highly degraded um, vegetation. But in some of these areas, there was also a very a known high density koala population um, within this habitat. So um, the project aimed to minimise the risk of death or injury to koalas during construction works. And that was the, the main key driver for, for this program. Um, it was in a very, it was a very high profile project and we wanted to make sure that um, we tried to manage these koalas as best we could while um, the rail project was um, being constructed. So we also thought, you know, there, there was going to have to be some translocation of koalas because some of this habitat, um, little fragments weren't conducive to animals staying there. And in fact, some of it would be cleared completely. Um, but we also um, understood that the translocation should be seen as a last option. It's an option of last resort and should only really be considered when the present threat to koalas living in their native habitat is severe or extreme. Um, the likelihood of surviving or contributing meaningfully to the local population was low. And also that the translocation recipient site must offer a better, um, better prospects for the survival of that animal than leaving them in situ at the donor site. Otherwise, why would you translocate? So some of the criteria um, that we um, developed to assess these sites for um, potential translocation sites, um, you can see here in the table. So we, um, we selected five, five key sites in the area, um, did some surveys of these um, sites, got a good assessment of the koala density at the sites and also the vegetation, the current vegetation status at these sites and went back and did a desktop exercise and looked at the um, these criteria here. So the landowner, um, the land tenure, the site connectivity, the regional ecosystem, um, that's one of the key key ones that we, um, we were assessing to look what vegetation was actually on these sites. Any threatening processes, um, 
the density of the koalas in relation to the overall carrying capacity and also um, site access and phone, mobile phone coverage, which might seem a bit random, but um, for the koala, it doesn't matter. For us monitoring these animals, we had to make sure that it was actually um, easily accessible and that we had mobile phone coverage to um, be able to use our tracking technology, um, which reports to the Telstra mobile network. So we picked Scouts and Griffin as our two sites. The Landowner Scouts Association and the Griffin site was actually a transport and main roads offset site. So a site selected for um, as an offset for the project. So someone had mentioned earlier about um, releasing koalas into Reveg. So we had very good um, data to show um, the actual use of koalas in, in these Reveg areas. Um, the land tenure was both conservation for both of these sites. Um, it was con it was connected. The scouts very well connected. It was a 150 hectare patch in a bigger um, bigger landscape patch, and the Griffin site smaller but still um, connected with habitat links to the surrounding um, to the surrounding landscape. The regional ecosystem for the scouts was quite a bit different to the Griffin one. So scouts had a mixed mixed forest of, of eucalypts, mixed open forest, whereas the Griffin site was more Teratocornus on alluvial plains. And we needed these two distinctly different sites because we wanted to ensure that um, the koalas that were used to a particular habitat type got put back into an area where, where they could find that habitat. Um, we looked at the threatening processes in the area. So we had collared resident koalas, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but we looked at the threats and based on historic data and based on current data that we were collecting, um, what the threats were and whether they could be mitigated. So the scouts, there was some wild and domestic dog management going on currently with the Morton Bay Council. Um, vehicle strike was low. It was, site was not buffering a major arterial road. Um, the scouts were doing, um, they had fire management plans in place. So they do control, control burns every so often um, to maintain biodiversity. Um, and there was a moderate um, to high disease prevalence at the site. Um, the uh, Griffin, for instance, there was wild dog management going on. Um, there was quail proof fencing along the side of the highway um, and a moderate disease prevalence. So we looked at the density of the koalas as well and um, determined that the site could support um, quite, a big, quite a lot of koalas. Um, scouts because of the sheer size of the site, 25 koalas and the griffin, probably 12 koalas. Um, and yeah, like I said, it had um, good mobile phone coverage. So once we select for selected the site, we needed to have a, a, a quite a decent look at the koalas and we looked at, to see whether they were candidates for translocation or not. So we looked at the individual home ranges of every koala along the rail alignment, and we classified this habitat based on their current and future threat level. So um, we had red, which meant that the habitat is very high risk to the koala, and it provides little prospect of safely supporting a population of koalas that can contribute significantly to the local population viability. Um, we categorized orange habitat as that had considerable impacts, but nevertheless contained uh, remnant habitat that was secure enough and provided some degree of um, functional ecological connection with other habitat in the area. Could um, um, safely, safely um, move to other habitat patches. And green was habitat that was considered relatively secure um, in the medium to long term and had impacts or threats that were less severe or significant um, or that were currently being effectively managed or mitigated. We also looked at the koala's health, reproductive status and um, considered their age as well. So in some of these little um, remnant patches, we had quite old females who were um, infertile because of chlamydial disease. And those were candidates to be left in place. They'd obviously lived there throughout their life. These animals were, were quite old um, and they weren't contributing in, to the population currently, and there was no need to um, to move them. They weren't going to disperse, um, and they were left in situ. Whereas other ones in that same site were young, healthy subadult koalas. 
that had very limited prospects of being able to safely disperse out of that area um, for breeding purposes. And so those ones were, were translocated. Um, and any other factors that we might have considered for these koalas. So um, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of mortality from wild dogs um, on the rail alignment or within the rail alignment polygons that we uh, were managing and monitoring koalas. And that resulted in quite a few um, of the, um, the orphans that were, that were um, recruited into the project. Um, so orphan koalas not having any um, current home range were ideal candidates to, um, to be moved into some of these translocation areas. Um, you can see, not really, but um, there's, a, there's a whole um, flow chart there on the right of our decision making um, process. So monitoring methods. Um, we decided that we were going to monitor these koalas for a minimum of three months and for the most part it, it was almost six months um, before we started translocating koalas into these areas. And this was um, something that hadn't been done before with other translocation projects and that was the ability to actually monitor resident animals at sites prior to the translocation of animals. Um, and these data that we um, obtained really informed um, the our K, our koala translocation program and um, provided good baseline data. Um, we determined the threat prof profile at the sites and mitigated these threats. So um, there's a wild dog up there in the in the corner of the screen. Um, wild dogs were a particular issue at the Griffin um, site. We had um, we had quite a few resident koalas die. Um, while we were tracking them prior to the translocation, um, which spurred on the, um, the Morton Bay um, rail um, wild dog control officer to actually target, specifically target that area. Um, threats were also uh, disease threats at the Scouts site. So that population had a particularly high prevalence of, of disease. Um, we monitored the translocation, co translocated koalas for 12 months. So that was our monitoring timeframe and that basically encompassed both the non-breeding and a breeding season for, for those animals. And all koalas were then uncollared. So some were monitored for more than 12 months, but 12 months monitoring was the minimum from, from the time we dropped the last koala into that translocation site that we monitored those animals. Um, we monitored them um, quite intensively, um, pr particularly when we first um, translocated them, they were, they were monitored um, daily or, and definitely remotely via our um, K-Tracker tags, our satellite tracking tags. And we were also able to then, um, like I said, for the Griffin site, figure out what was causing mortality of these resident koalas and um, actually adaptively manage and go, we need to now manage this, this factor and any emergent threats that might, that might pop up, we could manage before we translocated koalas back back to these areas because again we were translocating them so that they would have a better outcome and um, a better chance of survival. So some of the results, um, we only ended up translocating 28 out of the um, just over 500 koalas that we actually um, captured and got our hands on during the project. Uh, we obviously thought that this would be a much higher number but it turned out that most of the koalas were able to adjust their home ranges to one side of the rail corridor or the other. Um, you can see the picture here just shows some home ranges of koalas at the, the paper mill site using both sides of the rail cor corridor with the line, which is the red line, which is the rail corridor, um, bisecting their home ranges. So we translocated 12 koalas to the scouts and 16 koalas to the griffin site. Um, and the next slide here, you can actually see that um, they've actually, the same colours apply to koalas and they've actually moved um, their home range to, um, to either side of the, the, the rail line. So the age profile uh, for the koalas at the, the Griffin site was three years, which is quite low. And the oldest koala was five years old and the youngest was, was two years old. Um, some of the females had pouch young. Um, and this was quite confronting because um, we, we didn't find any koalas and we searched the whole site and we didn't find any koalas less than five years old. And, and that was really 
um, quite an indication that, that the wild dogs were having a significant impact in reducing the life expectancy of those resident animals. Um, the scouts, on the other hand, had um, an age span of two to 13 years. So we caught quite, quite a number of older koalas there. Um, and that was again, similar to the Moreton Bay rail um, koala, the average koala age on the actual rail alignment. And that was five years as well. So at the um, end of the project, because we had translocated um, particularly um, quite a few of the youngsters in there that would have the, um, would be dispersing and not have the suitable habitat in which to disperse um, successfully and safely. Um, the site, the age, um, the average age at the completion of the program was now 4.2 years for both the Griffin and the, and the Scout site. Uh, home range establishment. So there's often talk that uh, you can't move koalas to, you know, translocate or relocate koalas within uh, X number of, um, you know, kilometres from their actual home range because they'll try and get, get back there. Um, we found no evidence of site fidelity at all uh, in that we had no koalas attempting to return to their former home ranges and we'd actually translocated some koalas less than four kilometres from, from where they'd originated. Um, half the, the, and these animals established, usually established stable home ranges within three months. So they, they would move a little bit, um, settle in an area, and within three months, the, these animals were um, in stable home ranges and, and not moving. Um, over half of our translocated koalas established home ranges within 200 metres of their point of release. And you can see this figure here shows the distance from their release location to the centre of their, their home range once established. And most of them are within, the, the peak is within um, 200 metres on the Griffin site. Scouts is a bit different. Um, it was quite a large bit of bit of bushland, and you can see the figure down on the right here. The the blue area is the um, the scouts the scouts property, um, surrounded by a lot of um, habitat in the landscape as well. Um, and they the scouts koalas averaged 1.2 kilometres from their point of release to to their home range. Um, and this was significantly biased though because we did have one koala, um, one female koala, Maduri who decided on the first night to, to leave her baby, her 10 month old baby in the tree and disperse. So she headed east. We actually caught her um, because the baby was um, in a really large tree. So we actually caught Maduri and put her back with her baby in the same tree um, and she took off again. So after a few days, we actually brought the baby into care um, as one of the orphans for the project. So she, progressively headed uh, west and um, nearly eight kilometres later decided to st set up a, a home range and it was quite a stable home range um, out near Rush Creek in, in Moreton Bay um, Council area. So she significantly um, skewed the results from the scouts. So, but for the most part, most of the animals um, set up home ranges within, within the 500 metres of their release location, which was great, which tells us that um, we did our job properly, I guess, and picked, picked sites that were suitable for these animals that they actually chose to stay there. Um, survival mortality, that's another key thing, I guess, to, it's, well, it's the, the primary, primary driver, I guess, to um, assess whether your translocation program has been successful or not. Um, and overall, we had slightly better survival rates at the translocation sites compared to the koalas on the rail line. Um, the resident koalas, um, had a higher mortality than the translocated koalas, even though these weren't statistically significant. Um, but in fact, to say then that, you know, there was no difference between mortality rates from the resident koalas to those that we translocated. Um, the Griffin site, 50% of the resident koalas died before translocation. And like I said, that was from wild dogs. Um, and unfortunately, um, some of these animals, uh, four of these, six females were of breeding age so they were the griffin site was highly fecund and but we had quite a high um quite a high death rate from from dogs early on 
and scouts. Disease was the primary cause of mortality, so low fecundity at the scout site because of the, um, the high disease, and seven of these um, females were euthanized because of reproductive tract disease. So like Rosie said, you know, a lot of the females, when they do get reproductive tract disease, um, you know, succumb to it and they, and they don't get released back into the wild. Um, this is the, some of the early results from a, a student, Brooklyn, who did her honours project using some of the Moreton Bay Rail data. And she was looking particularly at the movements of translocated koalas. And it goes to show that um, if there were any impacts on the resident koalas. So again, it's another key thing for translocation. You're putting animals back into typically an unknown area. So we had, in this time we knew where the koalas were and what the resident animals were doing, but typically animals go back into an area and you have no idea of, of what impacts they have on the local koalas in that area. Um, so she compared movements, um, looked at the successive distance between each location. So in figure A, you can see that successive distance is the, the movements of the animal, you know, daily between, between locations and that distance. Um, whereas displacement distance is the distance between each location um, from their first, from their release location. So um, when we're comparing the movement patterns of these translocated koalas, so there was no statistical difference um, in the successive distance traveled by translocated koalas. Um, however, translocated male and female koalas did have a significantly increase their displacement distance in both the breeding and the non-breeding season. Um, so this means that the translocated koalas had normal amounts of movement. So they're not, they're not moving great distances over the landscape trying to find alternative habitat. They're actually doing normal movements based on um, comparisons between the, the control and Moreton Bay Rail koalas. So they're moving the usual distance overnight that you would expect a koala to move, <coughs> um, but they were moving progressively away from their release location. So that showed in the in the previous graph that they were setting up home ranges um, at a bit of a distance from, from where they were released. Um, in resident koalas, there was no significant influence on the successive distance traveled, but resident males did show a significant increase in the displacement distance following translocation. So again, um, we're interpreting this as that the koalas, the, the male koalas in particular, are moving from their home range, they're moving a greater distance um, at night, I guess, to um, to suss out the competition and the new kid on the block and um, yeah, paying them a visit potentially. So um, conclusions. Um, so translocation should always be seen as a last resort management tool. Um, let, you know, we try and, and make sure that the koala's you know, development is tailored to koalas. It's, it's based on, you know, koala sensitive design practices. So koalas can actually stay in the local area, but um, sometimes obviously this isn't possible. Um, so translocation will then be used to provide a better outcome or survival for the animal than let nature take its course approach. So rather than leaving it there in situ, um, moving it might be a better option to ensure its, its health and well-being. And also translocation mitigates threats to animals if they were left to disperse to alternative habitat. So rather than um, leave the animal there and if they need to disperse or if they're being um, pushed out of, of habitat that's been cleared, let's try and assist their dispersal and put them in an area where they potentially were heading um, and that is safer for them long term. Um, translocation always remains controversial due to historical programs that were poorly designed with potentially high mortality rates. Um, the impact on resident animals was largely unknown and there's always the ongoing perception that um, koalas die trying to find um, other habitat or returning to their previous home range. And, and we've just shown that with careful planning and management that you can actually achieve um, good outcomes for, for translocated koalas. Um, careful site selection is required to ensure that there is a similar diet or food tree species preference and the environmental conditions are consistent. So we were looking in the Moreton Bay um, local government area and in particularly closest closest to the rail 
rail corridor that we could find to to release these animals um and potentially you know and also making sure that the capacity to receive additional koalas um at at the site is is factored in as well because you don't want to put koalas back at a site that's at capacity and have them then disperse so um, potentially the the scout site you know some koalas might have encountered other koalas um, as they were being released and they've you know moved off within you know within the 200 to 500 meters but established a home range in the area but in this day and age really um, I had done surveys at that that site the scout site historically and know that the density was much higher back in um, you know 20 years ago than what it is when we decided to use that as a translocation site. So based on that historic data, we knew that that site could potentially support high numbers of koalas being translocated. And active management of threats before and after translocation is key to the success. So we need to manage disease. We don't want to put animals back um, into areas where there's a high, high chance of them becoming diseased. Wild dog control is, is key as well. Um, we had at the scouts, we knew that there were wild dogs and domestic dogs from the local residents running through through the site. But um, in reality, we had very little um, wild dog attacks at that site. There were two, two koalas that were translocated that got attacked within a week of each other and then there was nothing else and they were attacked in the same area too. So um, we had very little wild dog attacks at the scout site considering the, the big, large, um, um, landscape that they were that they were ranging in and of course road mitigation and, and fencing so to ensure that you know the koalas when the, if they do disperse they're not encountering encountering the roads so this active management is it is crucial to be able to monitor these animals and um, jump on any emergent issues and know that that you know you're on top of it and and not left not leave the koalas and go oh what's happened to all the what's happened to all the koalas and so to ensure that you can actually manage them effectively then and there um and and that's it just some acknowledgements department of transport and main roads that um funded the project endeavor veterinary ecology staff and contractors who um worked hard to um to manage all these koalas 500 was was quite a bit to um to deal with and the Morton Bay koala rescue groups who um happened to rescue some of these koalas when they um got up to um got up to no good the the hospital network and um of course the koalas themselves they're they're great little study animals and um yep some of them are still out there um doing very well um from from the project so um where some of the some of the Morton Bay koala volunteers are actually keeping an eye on on some of these areas and and encounter these koalas so we know that they're they're doing well okay thank you oh actually um any any further information on the the Rowling project you can follow that link there at the bottom of the screen great thanks very much Deirdre I think um everyone will agree that it's a really detailed study and from the department's perspective, it provides really important data as we start to review our translocation policies and, and look at the way in which we use translocation as a, as a conservation tool, not just as a um, last resort intervention um, yeah. uh, on every occasion. So I think the information you provided was great. So um, there's one time for one question, and that question yeah. is um, the carrying capacity for the Morton Bay, Morton Bay Rail Line uh, will no doubt be reached at some time in, in the near future. Um, the area is surrounded by high density residential suburbs. Um, the vaccines ensure that all koalas have bred in an increasing population um, will, will have an impact on remaining koala habitat. Um, how is that being addressed or how might that be addressed, I guess? Okay, yeah, so um, we have been monitoring koalas at the very western end of, of that, that corridor, so still at the, the mill site, which is undergoing development for Morton Bay Regional Council, um, where the uni is, um, is currently situated. And yeah, we have, obviously the koalas are getting quite abundant in that area, and not just that area, but all throughout the, the, the rail alignment, because it is still some of the last in, intact bits of bushland in, in the region. Um, 
And so we, we have done surveys in the past and done recounts of some of these areas and the population is still increasing. So based on our previous management work, they've still been breeding, breeding up a storm. And um, so, yes, we are currently discussing, I guess, um, means of trying to reduce those populations, um, which would potentially involve translocations of some of these animals to other areas around Morton Bay. Yeah, no, I can certainly confirm that uh, department's been involved in those conversations with both um, yep. Eve and with Morton Bay Regional Council. Um, and it's, a, it's an enviable position to be in, in terms of having koala populations that are actually expanding um, to the point where we feel we need to move animals to, um, uh, to other locations. So um, certainly some of that conversation is also looking at some questions that our previous speakers were asked about in terms of looking at um, offset sites and rehabilitation sites in terms of the potential for those to um, support koalas being translocated from other sites. So, oh, yeah, no, I was going to mention that um, one of those, the, the um, Griffin site um, did have koala, um, a lot of, I think it had 20,000 trees planted as, as an offset um, site for the rail link project. And we had koalas using those trees in as little as, um, you know, two years. So they right. were using those trees as habitat. That's great. Um, we're going to have to finish it there. Uh, the session's come to a close. Thanks very much for your presentation, Deirdre, and no thanks problems. to all the other speakers today.